Hello Church! It's good to be with you again today. This is our second Sunday of worshiping in our own homes, so I pray that you and your families are well. As I have mentioned before, you and I are church. We're not church because of where we worship. We are church because of Jesus. We are church because of who we follow, what we do, and who we are. So I thank you for continuing this ministry that we do in the name of Jesus. We are not called to stop our mission to share Christ's love, to love God above all things. We're not called to stop that during a time of isolation. Instead, we're called to do that differently. So I invite you to uh, finding creative ways where together we can do this ministry differently. So today as we gather for worship, I invite you to uh, gather whoever is in your home in the same place. Turn off your technology, except for the technology you're using to watch this, and to gather a candle. Uh, we're going to light that candle here in a few minutes. So let us now gather our, our hearts, our minds, and prepare for worship. And now we begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you were to keep watch over our sins, O Lord, who could stand? Yet with you is forgiveness, and so we confess. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned away from you knowingly and unknowingly. We have wandered from your resurrection life. We have strayed from your love for all people. Turn us back to you, O God. Give us new hearts and right spirits, that we may find what is pleasing to you and dwell in your house forever. Receive the good news, friends. God turns to you in love. I will put my spirit in you and you shall live, says our God. All your sin is forgiven in the name of Jesus, who is the free and abounding gift of God's grace for us. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you all. Please take a moment and share Christ's peace with those around you. And if you are able, also share Christ's peace with those who are your friends online, or give them a call even later and just simply say, the peace of the Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel according to St. John, the ninth chapter. As Jesus walked along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Jesus answered, Neither this man nor his parents sinned. He was born blind so that God's works may be revealed in him. We must work the works of him who sent me while it is day. Night is coming when no one can work. As long as, I am, as long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he had said this, he spat on the ground and made mud with the saliva and spread the mud on the man's eyes, saying to him, Go, wash in the pool of Siloam, which means scent. Then he went and washed and came back able to see. The neighbors 
And those who had seen him before as a beggar began to ask, Is this not the man who used to sit and beg? Some were saying, It is he. Others were saying, No, but it is someone like him. He kept saying, I am the man. But they kept asking him, Then how were your eyes opened? And he answered, The man called Jesus made mud, spread it on my eyes, and said to me, Go to Siloam and wash. Then I went and washed and received my sight. They said to him, Where is he? And he said, I do not know. They brought to the Pharisees the man who had form formerly been blind. Now it was a Sabbath day when Jesus made the mud and opened his eyes. Then the Pharisees also began to ask him how he had received his sight. He said to them, He put the mud on my eyes, then I washed, and now I see. Some of the Pharisees said, This man is not from God, for he does not observe the Sabbath. But others said, How can a man who is a sinner perform such signs? And they were divided. So they said again to the, man, to the blind man, What do you say about him? It was your eyes he opened. He said, He is a prophet. The Jews did not believe that he had been blind and had received his sight until they called the parents of the man who had received his sight. And they asked him, is this your son who you say was born blind? How then does he see? His parents answered, We know that this is our son and that he was born blind, but we do not know how it is that now he sees, nor do we know who opened his eyes. Ask him, he is of age, he will speak for himself. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that anyone who confessed Jesus to be the Messiah would be put out of the synagogue. Therefore, his parents said, He is of age. Ask him. So for the second time, they called the man who had been blind, and they said to him, Give glory to God. We know that this man is a sinner. He answered, I do not know whether he is a sinner. One thing I do know, that though I was blind, now I see. They said to him, What did he do to you? How did he open your eyes? He answered them, I have told you already, and you would not listen. Why do you want to hear it again? Do you also want to become his disciples? Then they reviled him, saying, You are his disciple, but we are disciples of Moses. We know that God has spoken to Moses, but as for this man, we do not know from where he comes. The man answered, Here is an astonishing thing. You do not know where he comes from, and yet he opened my eyes. We know that God does not listen to sinners, but he does listen to one who worships him and obeys his will. Never since the world began has it been heard that anyone opened the eyes of a person born blind. If this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered him, You were born entirely in sins, and are you trying to teach us? And they drove him out. Jesus heard that they had driven him out, and when he found him, he said, Do you believe in the Son of Man? And he answered, And who is he, sir? Tell me, so that I may believe in him. Jesus said to him, You have seen him, and the one speaking with you is he. He said, Lord, I believe. And he worshipped him. Jesus said, I came into this world for judgment so that those who do not see may see, and those who see may become blind. Some of the Pharisees near him heard this, and they said to him, Surely we are not blind, are we? Jesus said to them, If you were blind, you would not have sinned. But now that you say we see, your sin remains. The Gospel of the Lord. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. You can hardly turn on the TV or listen to news or have a conversation with pretty much anyone without having the subject of coronavirus come up. It's changing a lot of what we do. It's forcing us to come up with new patterns to our lives. And I believe people have been shifting their thinking from the initial shock and the preparation, uh, making sure that they have enough 
uh, enough meat, enough toilet paper, and all of these things, to the deeper questions. What does this mean? How long will this be going on? Why is this happening? What's God's role in this? Now, for most of us, we're used to feeling invincible. We're strong. We're depend, uh, independent. We're not used to having to rely on others or be vulnerable in any way. But what we're going through now as a worldwide population, frankly, has a lot to do with uh, people who uh, have received a diagnosis, that they're very ill. Or like with those people who... Uh, we describe as the sick and the homebound, those who can't come to church because of illness or mobility. When you're sick, when you are homebound, your level of social interaction declines rapidly. And you ask those questions, what does this mean? Why is this happening? How long will this go on? And what's God's role in this? Like a person who is sick or homebound, the presence of the coronavirus has affected our whole way of living. And this virus is very much like a child throwing a temper tantrum that demands all of our time and our attention. As people of faith, we don't deny, we can't deny the reality of the world around us. We can't deny and just pretend that the coronavirus is, is no big deal, that it's not something to be addressed or dealt with. But one of the strong themes that's running through John's gospel is the theme of light versus darkness. And our reading today from John chapter 9 that helps us to bring those themes to bear on how we see the light of Jesus in the midst of the darkness of the coronavirus. Now you heard the story Jesus and his disciples were walking along and they encountered a man who was blind from birth. And they asked, the disciples asked, who sinned that he was born blind? Was it his parents? Was it him? But see, from then on, the story seems to follow the track of sinfulness. Of course, a blind man being healed is going to get a lot of attention but do you see how this conversation shifts from being about whether the blind man uh, or his parents sinned to then becoming about Jesus and his sinfulness? Three times they say some version of, we know that this man is a sinner, referring to Jesus. They then also say, we know that God does not listen to sinners. Then when the blind man spoke the truth to them, they returned again to what they know. That you were born, speaking again to the blind man, that you were born entirely in sins and you, and are you trying to teach us? Because their theory was that this man had to have been born in sin, otherwise he wouldn't have been blind. And how could a man born in sin possibly have something to share or teach or some way to instruct the Pharisees? But the subject of sin in this passage is kind of like a conversational and spiritual magnet that draws us in, much like virtually any mention of the coronavirus. Mention that, and right away, it takes center stage. But in this story about the blind man, is sin the real issue here? Is sin and its relationship to the cause of the man's blindness what God really wants us to get out of this story? I heard a conversation with one of our Lutheran bishops. His name is Craig Satterley, and he's legally blind. So he shared his perspectives on this story about the blind man from his perspective. He said that a blind person knows that they can't see. They know that there are things that they depend on others for. 
He said that being blind makes you feel vulnerable. It makes you feel out of control, apprehensive, even afraid at times. But he said people who can see, he said the problem with people who can see, they don't know what they can't see. They think that see that they are seeing everything and what they see is all there is to see. And that translates into what I know is all there is to know. And the information that I have is all the information I need to have. And my perspective must be universally true and applicable to everyone. And I think that this is at the heart of the story of Jesus and the blind man. People who are physically seeing can be spiritually blind. The Pharisees thought that they were seeing spiritually. They knew about sin and that God doesn't listen to sinners. But their assumption that they were seeing and therefore knowing, they were missing something that they were seeing right before their very eyes. Their understanding of faith, their understanding of how God works centered on sin. That was the cornerstone for them, the fulcrum. So they had spiritual blinders on that prevented them from seeing other things. And since they couldn't see everything, their knowledge and their perspectives were incomplete. As we look at things like the coronavirus, we can't just look at, with our own physical eyes. That's what led the disciples to ask, who sinned? That's what led the, the Pharisees to continue thinking about sin and what, um, what a person could and couldn't do and that what God could and couldn't do. So what does the light of Christ do to coronavirus? It's much more than the trite, when life gives you lemons, you make lemonade. The light of Christ challenges us to not see things like coronavirus and ask, who sinned? It challenges us not to get stuck wondering, is this a sign of God's displeasure, God's wrath, his anger, or God's will? It challenges us to ask, is the point of God for all of us to be healed of every disease and affliction? Is the point of God to avoid death itself? The light of Christ doesn't lead us to ignore the realities around us, but to see them more clearly. It allows us to see them for what they truly are. The light of Christ challenges us to see with the eyes of faith rather than just our own physical eyes. The light of Christ helps us to see that it is not just our own power or strength, but it helps us to see God. It helps us to realize that we are like the, the physically blind person that is vulnerable, that needs the assistance of others at times, and we rely on God. We need God. But we need to learn to rely on God in real and tangible ways precisely because we can't see fully. The light of Christ calls us to see that Jesus is real and present, especially in our time of need, especially in our isolation, especially in our darkness. This is the grace of God that shines brightly in our lives. In the name of Jesus, amen. Let us pray. O oh God of love, we come to you today from our own homes. We gather together in spirit because we are not able to gather, to gather together physically. We know that you are with us as we worship, even when worship today is so different from what we are used to. We pray for and give thanks for all of the hospitals, nursing homes, and other health care facilities, the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, the World Health Organization, doctors, nurses, aides, scientists, and all who are helping us navigate together. We pray for our schools, teachers, administrators, and students, 
as they prepare for an extended time away from the classroom and their routines. Give calm to children who are fearful from all they hear and see around them. Patience to parents who are new now homeschooling and guidance for school administrators as they make decisions. We pray for small and large businesses, managers and workers who are anxious about how they will continue their work and especially those who are on the fringe of employment or are unemployed. We pray for our government and governments around the world that they will act together quickly and wisely. We pray for all houses of worship of all religions and denominations as they worship in ways that they can and as they care for their members and the community. We pray for the vulnerable among us, those who have compromised immune systems, those who are ill, those whose bodies may have trouble fighting illness, and those who are homeless. We pray for the people on Bethel's prayer list and those who are on our own hearts. O God of light, give us courage and hope. Give us peace. Give us a spirit of generosity that enables us to see the needs of others around us. Lift our spirits. Breathe your breath of new life into us, that we may take hold of the hope that you give us. All of these things we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let us now pray together in the words that our Savior taught us. Our, our Father, Father, who art in heaven, heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, now and ever and ever. Amen. Yeah. 
Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now go, be the church that God has sent into this world at this time to be his body being his hands, feet, voice, and heart in the world today. In the name of Jesus, amen.